everybody, and welcome to another edition of OTH Sports View. I'm J.P. Butler, alongside Times Herald Sports Editor and longtime Buffalo Bills beat man Chuck Pollock. We're back with our second edition of the week. On Tuesday, it was Big 30 football. Today, um, with their, I guess I would call it, anticipated 2016 season opener just three days away, um, the Buffalo Bills. We're at the point now where the offseason, preseason is over. Um, obviously, they've had some issues leading up to this point. There have been some injuries. There have been some suspensions. Um, there have been some obstacles to overcome. There have also been some bright spots. But before we get to that, let's just talk about uh, the end of the preseason um, and the cuts, the last of the cuts to get to the 53-man roster uh, today. Um, for the first couple of rounds, not a whole lot of surprises, maybe towards the end, um, a couple that could maybe be deemed as, as, as surprises. Where do the Bills stand with their 53-man roster after that round of cuts uh, last week? JP, I got to tell you, by the way, it's a lot of fun being interviewed rather being the, <coughs> being the interviewer for a change. Um, it's been a very interesting preseason for the Bills. Um, Cuts-wise, there really weren't a lot of surprises. Um, actually, probably only two, uh, Manny Lawson being axed at outside linebacker. And it's kind of interesting. I was not stunned by that because Rex Ryan, the coach, was genuinely annoyed at the injury he had suffered. He'd strained a pectoral muscle just lifting a, an obscene amount of weight. <clears throat> and that really set him back for quite a while. And then, of course, there was the rumor, which we don't know what's going to happen now because I don't believe he's resigned yet, but he was open to the possibility of being suspended for a game for a domestic abuse violation back in 2014. The other surprise was fullback Jerome Felton. I, I thought he was a total non-factor last year. Glenn Gronkowski had a really good finale uh, in the preseason, earned himself a spot on the roster. They saved some money by getting rid of Jerome Felton, so that... That wasn't a total surprise either. I think what people would be surprised at, though, historically NFL teams turn over like crazy. In the Bills' case, last year they had 72 players either on their 52 or 53-man roster or on the injury lists That's of different kinds. Right. 72 right. players. And of that number, 32 are gone. That's almost, almost 45%. That's an astounding figure. Now, of that group, two retired. One was kind of significant. Percy Harvin just had too many injuries throughout his career. The other was a young linebacker. They really liked A.J. Tarpley, uh, but he was concerned. He's a smart guy. He's from Stanford, I believe, and he, he had enough concerns about concussions. He decided it was time. Uh, they cut, actually, 23 players, uh, but one of them was Mario Williams, and he immediately signed down with Miami, and then eight players just left as free agents. Interestingly enough, three players went to two different teams. One, of course, where Jim Schwartz is uh, in Philadelphia. They, they, Nigel Braddon went there. Where, yeah, there. Ron Brooks, Brooks and there. Leotis McKelvin are all there. And, of course, with the Dolphins, uh, Mario Williams ended up there, Craig, Craig Urbic, and Marquise Gray, a tight end the Bills kind of liked. So the turnover has been huge, but I think you could probably say it's not stunning. When players leave as free agents, it's not a surprise. They're trying to inflate their bank account, and that's, that's their right. Right. Uh, again, we talk about some of the issues that have happened. Um, you know, we don't have to go on everyone specifically, but... Um, you know, some of the injuries, some of the suspensions, the latest one we can talk about it at the end is the thing that's hovering over now with Sean Charles Henderson, the tackle. But even having said that, offensively things look as though they could be potentially pretty promising and maybe even enough to overcome some of the stuff that they're going through now. Obviously they have high hopes for Tyrod Taylor who makes his return to Baltimore this weekend, if guys can stay healthy, if Sammy Watkins can stay healthy, if LaShawn McCoy can stay healthy, uh, some of these weapons that they have around Taylor, if uh, the line you know, can basically be what it was last year, pretty good run-blocking offensive line, then maybe there'd be enough offensively to sort of overcome the issues and maybe you know, be pretty good this year. How do you assess where 
the offense is right now? How important is it going to be for the offense to be good for this team to be good? Well, and, and clearly Tyrod's, he's the focal point of the, of the offense. But, you know, if you look at it right now, um, from my view, the, there's some talent there in the key positions with Tyrod, with LaShawn McCoy, and, and, and with Sammy Watkins. It's kind of a poor man's Andre Reed, Thurman Thomas, Jim Kelly. Um, those are really critical guys. If Tyrod and, and Watkins are on the same page, that helps. Um, I know people are down, some people are down on the offensive line, but I'll tell you this. This is a team that led the NFL in rushing last year. That wasn't an accident. And yes, they had some good running backs, Carlos Williams, who's now gone for reasons we discussed before, uh, teamed pretty well with LaShawn McCoy. And, and uh, Mike Gillisley came from nowhere to be very effective. But the offensive line had a say in that. So they're, they're pretty good, I think, in, in that area. Uh, my concern is the wide receiving depth. Um, and, and, and depth as a whole seems to be something that, you know, they're gonna is gonna have to be a, you know, something they keep in mind going going forward. No question. And and, you know, Robert Woods, I like the guy. He was he came to the team professional ready when he was drafted, but he, in my mind, he's kind of a pedestrian guy. And after him, there was such a battle. There was basically eleven players fighting for three or four jobs, and um, Walter Powell is a nice player, but he's he's not a difference right, maker, yeah, and the other guys, guys who made the roster, right. yeah, so that's a bit problematic. I don't think the depth on the offensive line is as bad as people might think, although I will say, Chantrell Henderson's impending suspension would be a bit of a factor, but they still have Cyrus Kwanjo at that position, they, they, they like... They like um, Groy at guard, and, and they signed that Patrick Sullivan at center. So I think they're okay there. Tight end is interesting. Charles Clay is a quality receiver. Jim Dre behind him is a blocking specialist. It's not an ideal situation, but it's not, it's not bad. But my prime concern offensively for them is depth at wide receiver. Right, and, and it probably will be a case this year of you know maybe going as far as you know, Tyrod will will take them even with some right. of the other, you know, circumstances around the team. But let's switch over to the defensive side. Obviously, this is a unit that last year took such a huge step back from the year before under Jim Schwartz. They go from being a top five defense. Um, then they bring in a guy who's touted as one of the best defensive guys and take such a monumental step backward to go from leading the league in sacks to setting, I think, a franchise low in sacks with largely the same personnel. This year, um, they lose some guys right out of the gate here that they thought were going to be contributors from day one. But in the preseason, the defense did look pretty good at times. Can this defense be better, or I guess it should be better than it was last year? How much better can it be last year? Where do you see that defense right now? I think. It's going to be a little bit better, but you look at the linebacking core and it's scary to me. It's a very, very pedestrian group. Uh, it's really interesting when you think of it, their first three draft choices were made with the express intent, or intent of making that unit better. Right away. And right so right all away. of a sudden Shaq Lawson, number one pick, He's, he, he has to have shoulder surgery out at least till midseason and he's not gonna hit the ground running then, it's gonna take some time. Uh, Reggie Ragland, mid middle linebacker, talented player, gone for the season. Adolphus Washington, their third-round pick at defensive tackle, has been very good, surprisingly good. Um, but the other loss on that defensive front, of course, is Darius, Marcel Darius, who's out for four games. So you can't say that unit is better based on the people who are missing. Right. The secondary, I think, is probably their strength. I and uh, you, I, I know you know a person very well <laughs> who's extremely right. critical of Stefan Gilmore uh, at cornerback, but he's a quality NFL guy, Carlos, Carlos uh, Ronald Darby. Ronald Darby. Yep. Um, very, very strong, very strong cornerback. And then after that, Nikel Roby and, and a draft choice uh, who really has been surprisingly good, sixth rounder, Kevin Seymour. 
they're they're pretty good there, right. and their safety position is so yeah, good. Two of the most experienced guys back. Again right, in that, and in you've that got six after. safeties. He can't even activate everybody every week, but they're such prominent special teams contributors. So there's a circumstance where the secondary is pretty good, but at linebacker, that's a pretty pedestrian group. Uh, Lorenzo Alexander, they really like taking over Shaq's, Shaq's position. Jerry Hughes on the other side is a legitimate pass rusher, but inside, it's they're not even sure exactly how things are going to shake down. Preston Brown will be one, maybe Brandon Spikes is the other, but that's not, that's a group they look to up, upgrade, and it has not, it has not changed. And what's going to make that defense better is if it can generate a pass rush, and that's to be determined. Right, and that was lacking last year. That's probably the biggest thing. If the offense is going to be pretty good this year, which it looks like it might be able to, the defense at least has to be able to do their part a little bit if the Bills are going to be right. good this year. You mentioned the, the special teams. They kept a lot of these guys because of their ability to contribute on the special teams. Um, and, 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 and two of just kind of the more peripheral parts I want to ask you about real quick, uh, the special teams that and then, and then uh, the, the, the penalties and how much of a factor that might be. With the special teams, they had the two kickers last year. They cut Jordan Gay, the kickoff specialist, so they are down to just having Dan Carpenter to kick off and kick field goals. He's looked pretty good. Again, he's been shaky at times, but he's looked pretty good, I think, for the most part in the preseason. Where does that unit stand? And then if you want to follow up, you know, the penalties, just to get that in real quick, how much better do they have to be in that area this year, too? That's, that, it's a maddening circumstance, penalty-wise, when teams are just mounting penalties on special teams. They're so punitive, and in, invariably, they're 10 or 15-yard violations, so you're, you're changing killer, your situation killer. every yeah. time. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to me, you know, we think, and it was true because, because Rex Ryan got on him about it, but Dan Carpenter, we have this perception that he was horrendous last year. He was 24 or 30 on field goals. What really stuck out to us was he missed four extra points right. from the new 33-yard right. distance. Yeah. But, but he's been extremely good this year. The interesting thing with Jordan Gay is that they re-signed him to the practice squad. And to be honest, I'm not sure, JP, how that dynamic works because he's played in a lot of games, but I, my guess is because you're a special teamer and the number of plays is limited, he's still eligible. So they could yeah. still go with a, they could go with a specialist there. Uh, Colton Schmidt is a high quality punter. Uh, and, and the reason you know that is not only did he average 46 yards a kick, his net was 41, which is fabulous. That's really good stuff. Where I find disappointment, and I think their coverage is going to be good because they've got so many safeties or contributors or good football players. My concern is, and there were years we didn't even think of saying this, but I think their return game is pretty well non-existent. Walter Powell is a nice player, but you used to, as, as much as he was in disfavor, Leotis McKelvin was a talented punt returner. Right, he's and, dangerous. Yeah, and there were a lot of guys like him they had over the years. And you always say, well, they're always a good return team. I don't know that they're a good return team anymore. And there's one name we haven't mentioned yet. We'll see how he factors into this. He used to be a pretty, pretty big name is Reggie Bush and what he might bring. I know he's going to be, I think, their number one punt return guy. He is. He is. And and that will be interesting because my guess is he will emerge as their third down back. So if his offensive responsibilities proliferate, I have a feeling they might not want to risk a 32-year-old guy bringing back punts. Um, but yeah, I mean, he seems to have a lot of the speed he possessed when he came out of college. Uh, so if he's an integral part, they could upgrade it. But if Walter Powell's the standard bearer, I think their return game is going to be pretty pedestrian. Right. Last thing, uh, being three days away, quick, you know, just general overview on how you think the Bills are going to be this year. And if uh, you're so up for it, maybe even a, pred a record prediction for 2016. You know, it's, it's interesting, JP, before this team started to have this nightmare offseason, I looked at the schedule and said, this it's, is a, it's a difficult schedule, I think, it, not, not to cut you off playing the, the NFC West and the AFC North. That, that's pretty tough. Well, and so often, 
it's it's less who you play, but when you play them, and and they're victim. They they got a they got a stretch in the middle of the season where they got three road games, tough oppositions, uh, opposition interrupted by a bye week. But the placement of those games is tough. They also have three uh, West Coast trips. But I will say, uh, I thought they're going to win eight games, and then all of this stuff happens in the off season. I'm thinking, you know, this might be a six and ten team. But it seems as if they've kind of gotten their legs under them. Yes, Chantrell Henderson is probably going to be sidelined for four games. Fine, he's the number four, number four tackle. Car- Carlos Williams, they cut him because they were of the opinion at 260 pounds and putting on weight, which is unheard of during, during preseason, he was not going to be a contributor anyway. And, and Marcel, I guess that's the price you pay for having a Pro Bowl nose who's just kind of had a history of, of, of marijuana use. But I've got to say, I'm, I'm optimistic, but to me, a lot of what this season becomes is going to be decided the first two weeks. Do you go to Baltimore on Sunday and, and beat the Ravens? They're not very good. Uh, they, were, they were poor last season, and partially because Joe Flacco was hurt and then struggled. Um, do you come back the next week at the stadium and beat the Jets? If you start 2-0, and because you're looking at two losses, I don't care whether it's Jimmy Garoppolo or not, but I think Arizona comes in and beats the Bills into Buffalo, and then, and then they go to New England and lose even with Jimmy Garoppolo. But if you're 2-0, and I think that sets you up to, to, to go 8-8, eight and eight, but 8-8 eight and eight translates to a 17th straight year without making the playoffs. Right, and I did you know, read somewhere that overall um, the Bills have the 10th hardest schedule in the league by this metric. But for the first uh, 10 weeks of the season, eight, eight, or 10 weeks of the season, they actually have the second hardest schedule in the league. So that's something that, you know, right away they're going to have to to deal with. See how they come, uh, see how they make it out of that, and then and then maybe we'll see where they're at if they can make a legitimate push at it or not. Uh, but certainly, uh, we'll start to find out for sure right. on Sunday. Right. Chuck will be there in person for that game and then we'll be back uh, next week with probably a recap of that and maybe even a look at the Jets uh, only four days you know, later right. um, and then see where they stand after that. So thanks again for watching and we will be back next week.